Good morning. Very nice to see you all again. Now we are going to do something extremely fun. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I'm having what the Germans call a schadengasm. getaway day and your last shot at his whiskey. Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. Hey everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining me today for the live stream in the studio. Good to see you all here. We got some familiar faces. We got uh, Sargon and Todd, Shiny and Alan. Hey Alan, Praveen, Red. Uh, good to see you guys here. So today I'll be doing something that I, I look back on my live streams and I can't think, I didn't seem to see this exact thing. I think maybe I did it once. Uh, but I'm going to be doing a sketch painting digitally without any lines, just using paint strokes, blocks of value or color to build up the caricature, to actually create the caricature with no line drawing. It's a method that I use quite a bit, and it, it actually works out pretty well for me most of the time. And I think that's just because, I mean, I just, I'm more of a painter, I think, than a draftsman. Uh, however, those paintings that I do this way, these sketch paintings, tend to have drawing errors in them or you know, just little flaws in the perspective or the anatomy. And I end up doing a tracing over on top of that to correct any of those mistakes. But it's, a, I think, a good way to get your thoughts out on paper to or digital canvas uh, to actually get the caricature done in a way that sort of is in line with my the way I already think and the speed at which I'm thinking about the caricature. Because with lines, sometimes it takes a little longer to get to the place where I want to be with the design. And I can change the shapes on the fly, on the silhouette. So, um, I, yeah, I think I, maybe I did it once on the Sean Connery. I can't remember. If you can remember, let me know. But uh, I don't think... Uh, I, I had to have done it once because it's a method I talk about a lot. And it's part of my Proco caricature course. It's one of the lessons, more advanced lessons on caricaturing. So uh, we're going to go over that today. And we're going to be doing a uh, painting of Paul McCartney. Sir Paul, if you're fancy. Uh, so, oh... Before I forget, I did finish my Legend of Zelda inking from two weeks ago that I did for the 35th anniversary. It's right here. There we go. There we go. Actually, I've got the digital 
I've got the digital version of it too, if you want to see it. Uh, it's probably easier to see that way than on the um, camera. But uh, let's see here. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, I think it turned out pretty well. I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, getting the exact details of Link's likeness was pretty hard because it was so small. But uh, I, I do like how I end up handling the, uh, the Guardian and all that uh, ink that goes down in the lower part here. I mean, maybe it's a, it gives a little work, but I'm overall pretty happy with it. And I did actually film the rest of the process, and I'll be releasing a uh, like a time-lapse uh, video of it. I'm in the middle of editing it, just not quite finished with the editing. Uh, but I'll get that uh, out, and you guys can maybe see the rest of the inking process if you're interested. All right. So, yeah. Miro, hey, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just, just trying to stream every two weeks now. I think it's just better for my schedule. It's kind of hard to keep up with every week sometimes when I've got uh, a lot of work on my desk. But uh, anyway, with that in mind, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, these are my pictures of Paul McCartney that I've got. I've got different eras. I've got young Paul and kind of the like, you know, looks like maybe late 60s, early 70s Paul. I, I wanted to do young Paul McCartney, not old Paul McCartney. I just, I love his youthful features, his baby face. He's very unusual looking, very distinctive. And in looking over all these, I came to actually a conclusion that something I had never noticed about his likeness before. And it's more obvious in this photo uh, that his features, um, like his eyes actually, not just all his features, but his eyes are really uneven. Uh, so I lined up his head, I, I organized his, or I tilted his head so it's perfectly straight up and down. I, so I lined up the ears. You can see the, uh, the alignment mark right here with the ears bottom of the earlobes, I lined up the mouth, the nose, uh, everything's lined up except if you look at the eye here, when I, if I draw a uh, this horizontal guide right through the center of the tear duct, his eye on his, his left side, our right when we're looking at him, is noticeably lower. And the same thing with the eyebrows too. The eyebrow on our left is higher than the one on our right. So that whole eye is shifted lower. And uh, it's something that you have to decide in a caricature if how you want to handle that because you could definitely exaggerate that uh, and make it more noticeable but if you draw the eyes just a tiny bit off in your drawing it'll just look like you have a bad badly aligned drawing because it'll just we people want to see the eyes lined up with each other and if it doesn't if they're not it just looks like you're a bad artist who was sloppy so if you're going to do it you have to really commit to it i think um However, if you do that too much, you might end up making him look like Quasimodo, you know, just like with one eye or Sloth from the Goonies with one eye just noticeably lower. And it just might look deformed. It may not look like him as much uh, because it is, you know, it's not grotesquely off. It's just a little bit off. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. It's always good to be aware of asymmetries in your subject. Uh, and then you have to decide how you want to handle it. Like, I might handle it more with just maybe the sagginess of one eyelid and maybe the eyebrow, one eyebrow will be higher than the other. I don't think personally I'm going to make him noticeably make his eyes uneven just because of that problem that makes it look like, you know, people will interpret it and think, oh, he just drew the eyes badly. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to use this drawing, but, um, or this photo, but I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, they're definitely slanted, Miro. Uh, slanted downwards, like a downward sloping uh, eyelid, or like the outer corner is lower than the inner corners on both eyelids, or on both eyes. So that's, yeah, that's a definitely a distinctive trait on him. And I think out of all the beetles, he has like the largest eyes relative to his face shape or to his face size. So that's something, if you caricature them together, he'll probably get sort of larger eyes, larger eyelids. Uh, the, the space between his eyebrows and his eyelids is also a pretty large space. Um, I love his sort of chubby cheeks here, especially when he smiles and makes him look like he has a real baby face. A uh, real small mouth is kind of how I see him as well in a lot of these. Even when his mouth is closed like normal, I'm, I would keep that small lip, small mouth uh, look and maybe exaggerate that uh, to, be, to be even smaller. Uh, sort of a long filtrum, I think. Uh, not, a, not a big chin, not a small chin. When he smiles, the chin looks pretty large, but when he doesn't, the chin looks like it's sort of receding. And if you look at him in like sort of these uh, like profile views, overall his head shape is like this upside down triangle, you know, like uh, like this. But again, his he doesn't have a recessed chin. It still pokes out a bit. It's just 
you know, his nose, I think, takes up more prominence on his face and his eyes. Definitely his upper his upper face takes up more space. So when whatever angle I end up drawing him from or painting him from, I want to keep those traits in mind. That overall triangle shape, big eyes, large space between the eyebrows and the eyelids, and so on. Small mouth, chubby cheeks. Um, now I only have two color photos here of him that I ended up liking. This one and this one. And I, I kind of want to do a color painting. But I might start it, I think, in black and white. So out of these two, I mean, this is great. This is very Paul McCartney here, this one of the sort of the mullet. Um, but this is classic Paul right here, uh, you know, just from the early 60s. So I think I'll try to start with this one here as my main one. And uh, I'll start with a black and white sketch painting and then uh, convert it to color as we go. So I'll keep that there. And I've got an image over here ready to go. He has bedroom eyes, yeah. <laughs> if that's your thing, why not? Um, yeah, let me know, guys, if you have any questions. Debbie will be here to join us shortly to help us with uh, looking over, uh, you know, all the chat questions and any questions you might have. <clears throat> so when I paint, I almost always like to start on a middle tone, maybe a lighter than average middle tone. You know, not exactly 50% gray, maybe a little bit lighter than that uh, canvas. So let me uh, fill that here. And I'll be using my, uh, I think my round quick painter brush. That's a good uh, all around brush for fast painting, speed painting techniques. And I'm gonna create a little palette for myself here of colors from dark to light that I can just sample from this little, this little spectrum down here just for ease of use. So just use a black and a white and then I blend them together. And that will be what I'm sampling from. I'm not going to sample from the photo, of course, because I'm going to start in black and white. I just want to be able to look at the color photo and be able to judge the values appropriately. All right. So let's start here. Um, you know what? Actually, the background needs to be a little bit darker because I think the, the color I got on the canvas right now is pretty much the value that his face is going to be. Okay, let's go a little bit darker in the background. There we go. And let's start blocking in his face here. I'm going to use the biggest brush I can to still, you know, be able to make decent marks with it, you know, to create shapes. But I don't want it small. I don't want to be tempted to draw lines with it. But I want to look at the shapes. I want to look at the, the, the shapes created by his skin, you know, the, the, the face, the side of his face, the neck. And then the hair, and how the two relate to each other. How much hair there is related to, you know, relative to the face. And I might go, you know, a little bit crazy with the mop top, maybe make it go off the uh, edge of the canvas. Um, or I could end up zooming out and, you know, you know, adding, you know, the, the proper contours. We'll see. I'll just leave it, uh, I'll just leave it sort of like this right now, just partially touching the sides. Alan says, you find a similar resemblance between McCartney and Sylvester Stallone from the younger years. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. It's sort of that really uh, Cupid's bow lip shape and heavy eyelids. Definitely very Stallone. But Paul's a little more pretty, I think. Pretty boy. How good you've started. I can say hello. Hello, hello everyone. Here. I'll be here fielding any questions that you have or comments, just uh, write them in the chat. So I'm not starting out completely full value darks and lights. I'm sort of starting in the middle, um, middle lights, middle darks, and then I'll go lighter and I'll go darker. I'll sort of branch out from this middle zone that I've reached. Just how I like to work. I like to work in the middle values as long as possible. Um, but I do eventually need to get dark darks in there and light lights to help me judge the values a little bit better. So it's it's a weird dance I do of like not having the full value range in there for a little bit and then I go for it. And then, you know, then I'll spend probably the bulk of the painting after 
having the darkest darks and lightest lights in there. I just don't want to put them in there just quite yet. Because it's tempting to uh, do that, and uh, I think it ends up making things a little bit more contrasty than they need to be from the get-go. And you don't want to rely on contrast, on strong contrast between lights and darks in a painting, at least not initially when you're building it up. Everything's done in the middle range, in the halftone range, especially a photo like this, uh, where everything is very, it's like faded. It's a cool vintage photograph. And, uh, and actually there, there are no bright brights or dark darks. The, the darks in here are not pure black and the whites are not pure white. And that's kind of a cool look. I'm going to try to mimic that vintage photo effect in my painting and my values so that the painting itself looks, uh, sort of vintage. I see his eyes as being far, far set back into his head uh, because he's got this long side of the nose. The side bridge of the nose is very, very long on him. Sort of gives him like a fishy look. But I'm sculpting the eye socket. I'm not painting the eye or the eyelid or the pupils or any of the details. I'm just sculpting the forms and the planes. And that's the way that you want to work if you're doing this digital paint sketching technique. You gotta work in values, you gotta work in planes, not in lines. And ideally, you start to see a uh, likeness emerge uh, from the early stages. I mean, I, I kinda do see a rudimentary likeness here on Paul. I think it's actually pretty good. Or it could be Ringo. <laughs> Ringo's got a pretty big nose. I wanna make sure it doesn't end up looking like Ringo. Maybe make pull the bridge of the nose back a little bit. And also, I see the uh, the lid on the far side of the head over there, uh, the eyelid and the eyebrow and the eyelashes. So I definitely want to make sure I include that. It'll give him that sort of fish-eyed look. Even though his eyes are set far back on his head, because of the angle, you know, we should be able to, well, in the, caric in the caricature world, still be able to see that eye behind this big nose, even though this eye on the right is going to be set far really back, set really far back. Hey, oh. Emily's joining us. Hey, Emily. Sorry, what was that? Just going to say, so I'm assuming that you're working all on one layer? Yep. I mean, I do have a, you know, technically it is on a separate layer. I don't know why I did that. I could be working on one layer. I just made it separate from the background. It's just a habit I have, I guess, sometimes um, when I do drawings, in case I want to export them later into another image. It's, you know, they don't have the white of the background attached to them. However, yeah, this is a painting, so I really didn't, you know, it's not a drawing. It's not a line drawing, so... I technically didn't need to start a new layer. There's no real reason for it. In fact, I'll go ahead and flatten it. There's really, yeah, like I said, no reason I mean, reason you don't for have it. to. I mean, if There's no have... reason to keep it separate, you know. Lower, less layers means, you know, more memory available to paint with. <laughs> Faster brush strokes. The more layers you have. I mean, it's not a problem with this painting. It's not a huge painting. But in general, if you're working on complicated, large paintings, large print sizes, it is better to have less layers because you will have, you know, less problems with crashes and less memory issues if you have fewer layers. So I recall Emily is a quite the big Beatles fan. A friend who's uh, joining in here. Let's, let me know how I'm doing, Emily, on the likeness. Yes, Emily is a fellow caricature artist. Court, are you willing to take some questions? I have at least one. Cool, yep. Alan is asking, when caricaturing musicians, do you ever listen to the music to get into the feel? What music do you prefer of McCartney, Beatles mm -hmm. or his solo career? Oh, uh, definitely. Yes. It's a great idea when caricaturing musicians. In fact, it's like, that's one of the reasons I love caricaturing musicians is because when I'm in the studio, I can totally listen to their music. When you're do when you're sketching or painting an actor, uh, you know, I can't really watch their movies to get inspiration necessarily other than just finding photo reference. But you know, because the, the movie is kind of distracting because I want to watch it. 
the music, yeah, you really get the feel of that person and what they're about, their aesthetic, uh, sometimes just from the music, and it definitely might affect your choices if you're listening to them while you're working. I'm actually doing an illustration for a record album right now. I can't really talk about it, but uh, yeah, I've been listening to the music a lot. Also for research, because it's going to help me with the album artwork, um, putting, you know, different details in the illustration. Uh, but see McCartney and the Beatles. Um, I mean, I love some of his Wings songs. They're great. I mean, Live and Let Die and uh, Band on the Run. I love singing those on karaoke. But uh, uh, yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, the Beatles is just, you can't beat the Beatles. The, uh, I don't know, I like some of, I mean, I, I really, I think I do like McCartney's songs more than any of the other Beatles songs in general. Just the ones that I end up gravitating towards, I find, I look at it and I go, oh, Paul wrote this. Of course, most of the songs are just a group effort and it's kind of, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a blend as to who wrote which. It's like they all had pieces on it. But I think there is, yeah, essentially one songwriter in a lot of the cases where the person that person brings the song to everyone else to record it or to contribute their efforts but i love you know when i'm 64 i love blackbirds i love uh, long and winding road golden slumbers i think i think most of those are paul's um i think he sings them at least but this so i assume that the person who's singing it is probably the person who wrote it i don't know wait he sings when i'm 64 Mm -hmm. He does? Oh, yeah. Who do you think is saying? I don't know. I guess I never thought about it. Yeah, he had that sort of old-fashioned aesthetic sometimes, or it's sort of like... Uh, it's not ragtime, but what is it? Like, you know, the like early 1900s sort of... Yeah, what is it? What is that era? Rag, ragtime? Yeah, it's, not, it's not really ragtime, but he has, you know, some of those songs like that that are in that vein. They're sort of peppy and upbeat and... Kind of cutesy. Like the Entertainer. Yeah. Do you know that song? Piano piece. Um, by whom? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. The Billy Joel song, The Entertainer. No. I am the Entertainer. Scott Joplin. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I kind of like that. I guess that is sort of ragtime. Yes, I looked it up. It is ragtime. Ragtime two step, according to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I'm using smaller brushes now, <clears throat> just because I'm in that stage where I need to refine the features and bring them out a little bit more. So, uh, but I'm still not going for lines. I'm still trying to paint in blocks of color. Emily chimed in and said, uh, yes, he was influenced by his father's 1920s jazz ragtime band. There you go. There you go. There's some trivia for you. Uh, Michelle Pacione says uh, he wrote When I'm 64 when he was either 14 or 15. He, you know, not sure when. Somewhere around that time, though. Cool. I didn't know that. And then uh, looks like we have another caricature artist who has joined us, Rick Wright. Hey, Welcome. Rick. And Shinies chimed in and says uh, she used to like the Beatles, uh, but then it joined a list of bands that she cannot even listen to for two seconds. What? <laughs> the songs are too slow and repetitive and get stuck in my head. Yeah, that's cool. They are pretty catchy, and a lot of the early songs are so short. Trying to get into that uh, play, you know, getting played on the radio, so... Two or three minutes was about all the time you had. So what are you thinking now when you're painting at this point? Um, I'm still going for the likeness. I'm still trying to block in shapes and not make, you know, if I see a problem, I'll try and try to fix it. I'm trying to think about the exaggeration while I'm trying to do this at the same time. So it's like going back and forth between likeness and exaggeration. And I have to kind of step back sometimes too and think, okay, can I, do I need to really 
reassess what I'm doing here? Do I, am I getting way off track? Do I need to like scrub something out and start over? Um, in the early stages, it's like, you know, I could, it could go south at any time. I don't necessarily have it locked in. So, yeah, I guess I'm just sort of just trying to be hypercritical and just mechanically just trying to get the likeness and trying to make the design choices that make it funny. I want to play up his sort of fat, fat cheeks too, um, even though he's not, you know, in this picture he's pretty young and he doesn't have distinct nasal labial fold. It's more about the plane changes, like the halftones, like where the darker halftones versus the lighter halftones are. But it's tricky because if I make, I just make him too, you know, too many plane changes, it's going to age him. It's going to make his face look older than it is. So I want to show like these chubby folds on his cheeks, his fat pads on his cheeks without going overboard or making the the nasal labial fold too long. So Court Rick was asking, is this going to be a color study today or just in black and white? Yeah, at a certain point I am going to, I plan to convert this to a color image. And I have a particular method of doing that. I, I might have shown it before in my live stream, if you can't remember. But it's a pretty uh, fun little thing to do when, if you've got a black and white sketch. However, you can't wait too long to do it. Um, i got to do it sort of early on after I've got the basics in there. Uh, because you don't want to just colorize a photo that's black or colorize an artwork that's totally black and white, you know, you know after it's already completely rendered. It, it looks weird. It looks like it, it has a tinted look. So I want to make sure it looks like it's painted in color, you know, the finished piece. So because the, uh, the finished color will have, you know, different color notes in it. It'll have cools and warms and just more color variation if I, if I paint it in color properly. If I wait till the end of this color, this black and white painting, and then tint it, it's more likely to be a more of a monochromatic um, exercise where it's it's just, you know, when they colorize old photos and old movies, it doesn't have all the subtleties and color differences that um, the real world has. So I guess you'll, I don't know if you know what I understand, you know what I'm saying, but I'll, when I'm uh, doing it, it'll be more clear. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so... <laughs> Seeing is believing. So Emily's asking, would, uh, is this an underpainting? Or I guess she's saying, is this an underpainting then? Or no, it's going to be a different technique? It's just, it's going to, it's a black and white painting that's going to evolve into a color painting. <laughs> so it's not really an underpainting in that Ooh. sense. I'm intrigued. Yeah, a lot of times when I have my own problems in my in my caricature work, if I'm doing an assignment or a job or a commission, <clears throat> and I'm having problems with the line drawings, doing sketches, rough sketches, just trying to figure out the whole thing, um, I'll switch over to doing a digital paint sketch like this without lines, and I often solve my issues. I just it just works out better, um, and it may not work out that way for everybody. Like not not everybody will work the same way I do because my brain works differently than yours. You know. And your brain works differently than mine. Maybe other methods are more advantageous to you than they are to me. Um, but uh, I always see a likeness happening faster. And, you know, I get to my finish quicker with less effort when I paint them. I, I should probably paint them more rather than draw them. But digital painting so, so makes it so easy to uh, change things on the fly. Not that it's an easy medium necessarily. It's just... But if you are a painter, it's sort of like a godsend. It's like with oils or watercolors, you just don't have this luxury of being able to just constantly, perpetually change anything you want and have no consequences. <laughs> 
consequences meaning like you know uh paint uh bleeding through underneath that if you try to paint over a a light area with a darker paint you know depending on the materials you know those paints will blend together and contaminate each other you know you don't have consequences like that with digital you just paint right over it no mixing no bleeding His eyelids are a little more sleepy looking than that. I'm going to lower his eyelids. So I'm squinting as much as I can whenever I remember just to blur my eyes at the reference photo. To get rid of the details, the extraneous details that I don't need for, at this point, and just see how my painting matches up to to that. You know, I can see that the front of the side of the neck needs a little bit of a darker half tone here to be more accurate to what's happening on the photo. Ear could be a little bit darker as well. Just the skin of the ear is uh, sort of a darker value, just because there's more red, more blood, I guess, closer to the surface. Then the rest of the face, the underside of the eyebrow, the, you know, the upper eyelid area could be a little darker as well, I think. And the actual eyelid itself, I think, is a slightly darker value. When it's uh, painted, it'll probably be a little cooler, a little bit more purpley, a little more blue than the rest of the skin tones. Even at his very young age here, he does have the beginnings of these marionette lines at the uh, corners of his mouth. Just a slight change in plane there. It's not like a wrinkle. It's just a bit of a plane change. So how old do you think he is in this photo? He looks really young. I mean, probably 22 to 24, somewhere around there. Emily, do you know what <laughs> uh, era is this photo from? I mean, obviously it's early, but... Because they were, he was about 24 when they... Came over, right in '64. Was is that right? They're born in around 1940. At least I think John was born in 1940, which would have made him 24 when they, you know, hit the yeah, Sullivan wasn't show. Paul younger? Was that? I think Paul was younger, right? Maybe. Well, they were, you know, childhood friends, so they probably were the same age, maybe within a year of each other. But yeah, I'm not a Beatles trivia expert. Anybody that does know, you know, in 1964 when they came over, it was '64, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, Emily or anybody. <laughs> Uh, Emily says he was 22. 22, okay. Okay, I'm going to go a little darker now. I'm pretty happy with how things are going, but I need to go to sort of that next level of value. But I don't want to go pure black. Because I want the darkest dark to be just a little bit shy of pure black. I don't want it to be pure black. Because this vintage photo doesn't go cool. Well, it kind of does. I don't know. Let's see. Let's. I'm going to sample this photo here just to see where it sits on the timeline or on the color field. Um, I'm not going to use it to paint with. But yeah, actually it is almost pure black. So like the darkest it is part of his hair is right there. It's not pure black, but it's, uh, but it's close. But I'm going to go just a little bit lighter than that, I think. Just to heighten that vintage effect of the uh, old photo. So I'm probably going to go, you can see where my uh, color picker is over here on the left uh, in the uh, in the color palette. It's not quite down as far as it can go. It's sort of like I'm adding an Instagram filter to make it vintage, but I'm doing it by, you know, with my painting choices, not with an actual filter. Yeah, 
has quite a bit of highlights on the top of his hair here. So Rick has a question about the black and white converting to color. Do you ever take the color photo you're working from, convert it to black and white for the beginning stage, and then go back to the color photo? Yeah, yeah, I, I sometimes do when I want to make it easier on myself. I'll definitely uh, work from a black and white grayscale photo. Um, because that is the honestly the best way to do it. If you want to be more accurate, you don't have to go through the extra step of converting these colors that you see into black and white values, which is sort of an extra mental step. However, I've done a lot of painting from life, like landscape painting and painting from the model, and you don't have that luxury. You just kind of have to be able to look at the model and convert those color shapes into black and white values if you're working monochromatically. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's that, I don't know if it's just I want to challenge myself a little bit more, or I just want to demonstrate that that's how you have to do it a lot of the times in the real world if you're working from a, a live subject of some kind, you have to work from a color reference. And I haven't done any planes at plein air painting in over a year because of the pandemic. I just haven't gone out to parks and stuff. I don't want people to come up behind me and like get close to me while I'm working. So I just haven't gone out. So I haven't done a lot of painting from life and I haven't had any life model classes. So um, yeah, this is my way, I guess, of just sort of trying to keep up those skills of translating real world color into values. It's a good skill to have because, you know, if you're doing a drawing, especially, you know, if you're doing a black and white charcoal or pencil drawing or just a monochromatic painting, you need to be able to do that. Okay, the only thing that's really not quite resolved yet is his lips, his mouth area. Just spend a little bit of time on this here, and then I'll uh, convert it to color. You can see just a bit of his teeth in there, but I don't want to draw a lot of attention to him. Just show that the mouth is parted a little bit. Okay, we're getting there. So I have a question for me. Sure. And people might want to know, are we going an hour or 90 minutes today? Ooh, um, I imagine, I mean, I could definitely spend a couple hours on this. No reason to, I mean, because I'm going to go with color and that's going to probably take a while. So I probably imagine I'll go till one, you know, an hour and a half total time. Okay. Okay, I think I need to go a little bit lighter for the collar here. It needs to be lighter than the skin tone. It's almost a little too bright. I want to darken that a little bit. So I don't want to go full bright white value.
Yeah, it's reshaping the back of his neck here a little bit more, the collar. Okay, I can get rid of my little value scale over here. And I'm going to go color now. I'm going to um, take this. I'm going to actually should probably save it in case anything happens. Okay, and then um, I'm going to now, it is a it is an RGB image already, so that's good. It's not grayscale. So I'm going to go to image. Uh, let's see, I guess it's adjustments. And is it color balance? There's a couple different ways you could do something like this. So I think, yeah, there we go. So I'm basically just taking these values and I'm just shifting, right now I'm just shifting the midtones just to add a little bit of color to them. I'm going to try to aim for the general zone of the color feeling of the original photo, but it'll be, it'll be essentially monochromatic. I'm not going to be able to like add colors independently where I want to. I'm just overall going to be able to tint the image a color and it's going to get basically get me started. Uh, I think mostly I'm going to, going to try to get the uh, half tones of the skin tones right in that range of sort of that realistic skin color. And I can work in the highlights and the shadow tones too, right? Then I was in the middle, and it was in the mid-tones, I was adjusting those. So if I want to make, say, the uh, highlights a little bit uh, warmer, I could do that. But it, do it does affect everything. It doesn't just affect just the highlights. So it's, yeah, I mean, it still changes everything, maybe too much. Let's see, can I I'll go to the shadows and just maybe make those a little cooler? And go back to the mid-tones and make them a little red and yellower looking a little too purpley okay that's probably as close as i'm going to get and, that, and that's enough i don't need to uh tweak it too much more than that so now i've got a sort of a color image but it's all monochromatic so now i need to work on getting some um, color variation in there and let's start with the background let's make the background a little darker and it should be a little cooler I think it should be a little have a little more blue in it and I'm still using the same paintbrush I've been using the whole time it's just this simple quick round painter which is in my brush set which is available on my website and on Gumroad uh, but uh, but it has some texture to it. It's not just purely flat and uh, digital looking. Let's go a little bit darker. Maybe a little more neutral too, not quite so much uh, color in the background. A little darker still. We want his face to pop out from the background more, so it needs a little bit more contrast, even if it's... You know, I don't necessarily need to copy exactly what's in the photo, but what's back there is pretty cool. I just, uh, I'm using it as a starting point, and if I don't like how it's coming along in my own painting, then I can, uh, I can change it. I don't need to be a slave to what's in the photo, for sure. And in fact, I prefer to modify the background from the original photo, so it doesn't look like I'm just copying a photo, like, every pixel of it. And uh, I gotta watch out for like this halo effect. I don't want the under painting that's, you know, the color that was there to show through near the face. It'll look like it has that glowing effect, which it could be cool in certain areas, but it's not really my intention. So I'm going to paint right up to that edge. The edge of the face. Okay. So now I'm, I'm just sampling colors or the tones from my painting here and just modifying them now because I do like the overall value range that they're in, but I just want to change the color to make it more, say, chromatic. So there's going to be more red in the ear here, but I won't really change the value. I'm just changing the color. It's 
same thing with the face here. I'm going to go a little bit cooler, I think, in the flesh tones. Maybe just a tad lighter on the cheek here. But yeah, adding that cool now next to the warm really adds a nice vibration. It makes it look a lot more realistic without having to do very much at all, actually. It's just a lot of the work is already done for me, and I'm just sort of tinting, but I'm also adding color variation, color temperature changes. Okay, I'm going to go a little cooler, maybe a little grayer down in the beard area here. Cooler in the neck. But i got to make sure I stay within the right value range. I don't want to paint over an area with too light of a color or too dark of a color. I want to stick close to what I originally indicated value-wise, but just with a different color temperature. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, I'll I'll definitely put it on the list if that's something you want to see. You know, yeah, caricaturing the bodies is so so subjective, even more than the face. You can definitely play around with that and not worry so much about losing the likeness on the body. Uh, the bodies and caricatures and caricature illustrations, I mean, they can be reflective exactly of what you think about the person's physical body type. Um, you know, if they're really thin or really, you know, heavy, that's something you need to probably be loyal to in the picture. However, you know, if they're middle of the road, you, there's a lot of leeway. Like, I painted Trump with sort of like baby toddler proportions, even though he's sort of a big tall guy, just because that's what I wanted to do at the time. I just wanted to make a statement about, you know, him overall. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, you don't necessarily need to be true to exactly what they're doing with their body type. So limbs could be longer, limbs be shorter, fatter. Um, it's more important to get the pose looking good, the action of the pose, because usually to put in a, when you're putting a body in a character, it's for the purpose of selling a point, you know, telling a story, having them do an action or complete an action. And it could be just a practical reason. Like maybe the person in the caricature needs to be driving a car because of that's the particular gag that the art director wants you to do. So you have to satisfy certain minimum requirements. The body has to be doing um, those kind of actions. Uh, but the proportions, yeah, I think are more up to you, more so than they are with the face. The face, if you miss, you know, the proportions or don't, you make weird out of the blue choices, not based on their likeness, you're you know going to lose the likeness. But it's, yeah, you don't need to worry about that. That was so much with the body. You can, you have a lot of leeway, I think. Putting some cool darks into the hair here. Um, to balance out the warmth. Overall, this was a very warm tinted image. Same thing with the suit, too. I'm going to add a little bit more cool. It's 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 technically a red, but it's a red that's very close closer to purple than it is to orange, so it's reading as a cooler color. Yeah. I guess a question someone has, I'm not going to try to pronounce the screen name, so I'll screw it up. Um, but have you ever thought of turning on Twitch? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't have any audience there right now because I don't have a Twitch account and I don't use Twitch personally. Um, I, I guess it's real popular with gamers, but I don't, I didn't know if it, any artists were really on there because I just haven't really looked at it. I guess I, if I, I guess I could just simultaneously stream, stream on Twitch and YouTube at the same time. I just don't know if I have to be in Twitch or in YouTube primarily. Like if I can just mirror my stream in Twitch or if I have to be in Twitch instead of, I just don't really know how that works, you know. There's a lot of complicated things when you're doing like live streaming. I like to keep it as simple as possible. And I don't know what, what would be the reason for me to go to Twitch. I mean, to grow my audience. I mean, that's okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really concerned about my audience. I just like doing this. And I, for the people that are here, that's good, you know, but it's not like I'm looking to become a famous YouTuber or Twitch streamer or anything like that. It's just, just something I do to pass the time and connect with people and keeps me, you know, kind of more on my game because I'm, I have to draw and paint more than I might normally would. 
because I have to come up with stuff for the stream. So my reasons for doing it are, you know, just for, just personal enjoyment, really. So I don't know if uh, Twitch would add to that. I guess there's, if there's no harm, it's not too much extra work. I could try looking into it. I think if someone could give Court a reason why he should go to Twitch, that would make it worth worthwhile in his eyes. Then he might. But mm. right, Court. Yeah, convince me. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not opposed to it. I just have uh, I haven't I haven't given it much thought though, because because it's one of those services I just don't use, and so I don't really think about it. It doesn't really even enter my mind. You should play Zelda on Twitch. <laughs> no, there's plenty of those guys. I, I I probably would not be as entertaining as most of them. What's one more? Well, because I, like, I, I play my games and I don't, like, react to them as I'm playing them. Even if something cool happens, I just kind of, like, my face would be just blank. I don't know. It's it's kind of more of an effort to think about reacting to something when you're, it's like you're performing for someone while you're playing the video game. And, you know, I guess some more people are more natural at that. But I think it would be harder for me to naturally do that. I'd be feel like I, I feel like I was being, you know, fake or something like, whoa, look at me, I just found a Korok, woohoo, I'm awesome, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so Herman is asking, do you have a favorite Beatles album? Um, I, God, I love them all so much, it's hard to really, I mean, I love parts of them, there's certain songs I don't love listening to over and over again, like, I don't know, like like Wild Honey Pie, it's just kind of, you know, or Revolution Number 9. It's just, that's that one that's all, like, artsy. Like, I don't know, it's just not very musical. But there are ones, yeah, the ones I love, I don't know, I just, I love Sgt. Pepper, the most of the White Album, uh, <laughs> um, Revolver, Rubber Soul. Rubber Soul, I like that one. I really like this one song that they did that's... I don't think it's on any of their major releases. I think it was just a single. It's called Rain. And it's just a beautiful song. I just... I love it. There's great harmonies in it. It's very Beatles-esque, but it... Uh, and they do have a video for it, and that's how I saw it. It was, like, on YouTube, I think, at some point. I'm like, whoa, I've never Wait, heard of this song before. A video? Was yeah. it in a movie, or...? Well, it was, like, a little film they made. Yeah, they made... A, you know, they, were in, they made music videos back then. It's just, like, I don't know why they made them, though. It's like, what did they show them on? Because it wasn't an MTV. I guess other programs aired those videos, you know, in lieu of making a live performance, they didn't recorded something, I guess. Apparently, Rain was on the B-side of Paperback Writer. Okay, so it was a single. It wasn't. It was yeah. part of a single. It wasn't. Well, it was the B-side of the single, Paperback Writer. Yeah. Uh, both were written during Revolver, though neither appeared on the album. So... Interesting. Wait, Paperback Writer wasn't on one of the uh, main albums? Well, it was, but it w it was written during Revolver sessions, but I guess it was not on Revolver. So neither appear on that album. Oh. But uh, yeah, Paperback Writer was on an album. Don't ask me which one. Mm -hmm. I know, but uh, I can find out really quick. Yeah. Oh, and it's um, it might be important to know just back to that painting here that um, I'm not using my brush in color mode. If I were, I mean, color mode is like the tinting mode. It, it just affects the color of the pixels, but not the values. Um, and that is one way to go. But um, I don't generally like the look when I use the color mode on my paintbrush, uh, just because it ends up looking like I said, it makes it look like a tinted photo. Um, and those just have a really peculiar look to them that looks like a tinted photo that they just don't look like a painting like there's a cool bluish green in the beard here that i kind of like you know i am painting over it a little bit right now because it's a little too light but uh those little happy accidents sometimes happen when you're painting with real colors and with real consequences you know it's not just tinting what's there it's actually painting opaque paint on top of what's there um and that, that that's just the method and the look that i like the best so yeah, I don't like using the brush in color mode when doing this.
So I guess Paperback Writer was actually on a couple of compilation albums. So it wasn't ever on. It's, you know, it was written during Revolver, but didn't make the cut, I guess. Hmm. It was released as a single. As Emily said, it was a B-side. So... Yeah, there were a lot of compilations as they tried to reach new audiences and things like that. Because I know I grew up in my house, we had a compilation album. And I didn't realize it was a compilation for a long time. It was the one that originally had all the uh, baby doll parts on the front. Oh, yeah, that was their controversial cover, right? Um, yeah. Originally, didn't they want like like raw meat, bloody meat and stuff like that? I think so. But of course, ours did not have the baby dolls on the front. Ours had the one that was approved, I guess. I need some cooler reflections in the hair here, or highlights, you might call them. Okay, so I'm getting to the point where it's like, hey, where do I go next? I just, I basically just go to wherever the picture's calling me. There's no real rhyme or reason. I just jump around different parts of the face a lot. If I see something that's off, I'll address it. Or it could be if it's too dark, I'll lighten it. Or if the edge is too hard, I'll soften it or vice versa. So one good point was made about being on Twitch. More people are used to watching live streams that there than they are on YouTube. So mm. you would probably, possibly be exposed to a larger audience if you wanted to. Yeah, when you get those larger uh, audiences though, I've seen real popular streamers like game streamers, they'll just have their comments are just flying by because they have, you know, a thousand people watching at once or more. And uh, it's, it's impossible to basically read any of the comments. And I don't want to be that popular. Then, you know, no one's comments will be able to make it on, on screen. That's of course, I'm not have... saying I would be that popular. Right. I mean, exactly. art, art live streams are never going to be that as popular as gaming live streams. I know. I'm just kind of joking. And I can always help. I guess you can turn on slow, uh, slow chat, I think, is where it happens, where it's sort of... Um, if it does have a really like a lot of people in the chat, it'll like slow it down and put a delay on a lot of people's comments or not show all the comments. Yeah, that explains it. Emily says the American albums were different than the British ones. The record company mixed up the contents. So you never know what you were getting, I guess. And then Alan was asking if you've ever visited the Beatles Museum in Liverpool. I have not. I've never been to Liverpool. Been to England a couple times, but we never made it north or anything. Went to Abbey Road and that was about it, right? Yep. I think I'm going to um, change up my brushes a little bit here. I, in fact, I'll, maybe I'll smudge a little bit. Um, use my canvas smudger. Just to get some more painterly effects in here. And I'll, I'll paint back over them. And I'm not going to, like, you know, go too crazy with the blending brushes, but... It can help you get to a place a little bit faster, like with the hair here, if I'm just using this streaky canvas blender, it really does a lot of the work of making it look more like natural hair, because my original brush was pretty blunt. And this one sort of takes takes the pixels that are there and just, it's like running a streaky pixel or a streaky bristly brush through the paint, creates some nice natural texture.
Okay. Paint with a uh, more of a textured paintbrush now. See, it has more of a round, yeah, round linen canvas. It's like my quick round painter, just a little bit more uh, texture. Paint with one single brush the entire time. It just makes the painting, you run the risk of it looking monotonous. Like everything's handled the exact same way everywhere. And I like to have a little more variety. Just like, like I have, I like to have a variety of edges, a variety of color temperatures throughout the painting. It just sort of mixes things up and uh, throws some unexpected little happy accidents in there. noticed I haven't zoomed in at all on the painting either. I just haven't really felt the need to. Uh, the longer you stay zoomed out without getting in too close, the more uh, likely you'll be to paint uh, more of a painterly loose approach, I think. Because if you get too close, you end up wanting to re resolve details in a way that's a little bit, um, well, it's too um, precious is sort of the word I've heard of it sometimes, um, where you just you get too precious with the details and it sacrifices the overall big picture. And certain areas might, you know, have too much attention drawn to them with too much refinement, too much hard edges everywhere in a certain area. I think it needs a little work here is his nose, just getting the planes of the nose right. It, right now it's just kind of overly soft everywhere. So maybe I'll switch back to, well, I guess a streakier brush, harder edges, yeah, like that. And get some harder edges and plane changes on the nose here. There's this cool rim lighting on the left side of his nose, but in order for that to work, there needs to be a slightly darker value on the front plane of his nose just to make it pop, make it look actually uh, three-dimensional. Because that's kind of, that's what's happening in the photo, too. Yeah, if you have this nice rim lighting on something, you really need to have a dark right up against it. Otherwise, it doesn't quite have the same impact. I guess I will zoom in a little bit here just so you guys can see a little bit better. I mean, because if you're watching on your tablets or phones, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Yeah, but normally I probably wouldn't zoom in quite this much for my own benefit. It's more just for viewing purposes.
He's putting a pretty dark dark on the bottom plane of his nose. And then I got to transition it gracefully to the uh, to that lighter half tone that's right next to it. Did you uh, answer the question about the 80-20 rule? Oh, no. What was that? I didn't see it. That's okay. I stepped away for a bit. I had to taste test something I made. Um, do you, what do you think about the 80-20 rule? Herman was wanting to know. Um, what is the 80-20 rule? I don't know if I know exactly what you're referring to. I don't know. German? German? Herman? Herman? Herman. Herman? I don't know. Accent is on the second syllable, it looks like. Yeah, let us know in the chat what you're referring to, what the 80 20 rule is. I might have heard of it, but I might have just forgotten. <laughs> or maybe it's called something else for you. You know, some of these rules have very variable names. Yeah. Uh, have a couple answers. The 80-20 rule, 20% 20 of the work accounting for 80% of the result. 20% of the work. I, I, I don't really have a thought on that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I still don't know exactly what it's asking. I, I think it's actually a business rule. I'll look it up. I've heard it before and I think in terms of business that you do 20% of the work and get 80% of the results or something like that. Guess I've never really heard it applied to artwork though. Also known as the Pareto principle. The Pareto principle states that for many outcomes, roughly 80% of consequences come from 20% of the causes. Other names for this principle are the 80-20 rule, the law of the vital few, or the principle of factor sparsity. Sparsity? Sparsity? Sparsity. Yeah, still, I mean, that I don't see how that really applies to what I'm doing here, or art in particular, but yeah, so I'm sorry, I don't have any thoughts on it at all, because I, I mean, I, I don't even know if there's a question in there, like, what do I think of it? I don't know. <laughs> Not to be dismissive or anything, I just, I don't have any, nothing comes to mind when that's explained to me. I, I mean, is that what, is that what's going on with my artwork? Like, I don't know, because I'm working 100% of the time that I'm working on it. So, I mean, um, there's no part where I'm only working 20% on it. I guess there are people out there in the art world that are using the 80-20 rule to improve their art and help people improve their art. So maybe it's something we should look into. 
Guess. See what it is. 80-20 rule for artists. Yeah, I've, I don't think I've ever heard of it except in business classes. So. Okay, now I'm switching to the Velvet Natural Velvet Round Brush. Just because I don't want everything to be super streaky everywhere. Because I was getting a lot of uh, streaky strokes. Broken strokes. And that's cool to have, but yeah, I don't want them everywhere. Because then his face might start to look like hairy. Like, it's, like all the texture has a hairy texture. Adding a little bit of cools in his uh, in his eyeballs, a little darker gray where the shadows of his eyelashes are falling. But not drawing individual eyelashes and just kind of painting broad strokes, soft strokes in that area. Okay, let's zoom out a little bit here. Looking not too bad. Let's see, maybe I can go back in the hair now and just add a few more, uh, you know, details. A little more harder streaks in places. Slightly lighter, cooler highlights. So I'm using my uh, one of my hair brushes, the Hair Biggie, right now, in case you're wondering. It's for uh, broader swaths of hair, like locks of hair, and then uh, then I have a smaller hair, smaller hairbrush that's more meant for individual flyaways. So I probably won't be using that because I'm not really going to make this painting about that. It's not going to be like, like a realistic, you know, Kruger or a Siler painting or anything where it's every hair is perfectly rendered. <laughs> more more broad strokes in this uh, painting in this. You know, it's still kind of a sketch. I mean, I guess it is evolving into what you might call a painting or a portrait, but um, the difference for me, the difference for me between a sketch and a portrait or a painting is basically just time, time and the amount of rendering that you put into it. And in an hour and a half, I think that's the zone where it stays kind of a sketch more than a uh, actual painting. Another question. Do you spend a lot of time on post-processing after being done on a painting to push it to a finish, or do you try to achieve a finished result solely through brush strokes? Yeah, so almost, yeah, pretty much everything through brush strokes. I mean, there is one little tricksy thing I do sometimes, or I've done in the past. I don't really do it much anymore, um, but it's adding like an overall texture to everything to make it look a little more vintage. It's sort of like the uh, equivalent of adding an Instagram filter for real. Uh, but it's actually just adding noise and uh right at the end i'll take I'll, I'll do one of those to show you how i do it there's a couple different ways you could probably do it but uh it's just something i invented one time i think i was i think i came up with it when i was trying to recreate for a client the lord of the rings poster it's like a, a caricature version of that and i had to uh create a lot of visual noise or texture over the whole image because i noticed 
that's what the original poster had was this sort of grain like a film grain over everything and uh there's a way in photoshop to do that that's uh you know you can control the output and effect and the color of it no yeah i'll show you that toward so stay tuned in the last you know actually then i'll do it in the next five minutes because we're almost getting up to our time here I'm just going back and forth between lights and darks in his hair here. I was using a sort of a cool grayish color with some of the highlights, and I'm going back to a dark, using the darkest dark in the painting uh, to cut back into those into the hair with some darker shapes to break them to break up the lights. And the highlights on his hair are, I think, quite a bit cooler and lighter than that, like at the very, very top. So I'm sort of building up to it, but it's somewhere in this range here. And then I might use the... Uh, my streaky texture brush to uh, reduce the impact of these this highlight a little bit. Just I don't want them to be quite so cut out looking. So I'll just blend them in a little bit, but not too much. I want to keep those hard edges. I just want to fade them out a little bit. There we go. His hair looks nice. Yeah, it's come out uh, looking not too bad. It's important too to mess up the hair a little bit like not every stroke is going to be perfectly radiating out from every other stroke around it some are going to overlap in awkward ways um, and that's going to bring some imperfection to it you need some imperfection to make it look more realistic when you're doing dealing with the hair i mean his hair is pretty nicely coiffed but it's uh you know you don't want to make it too perfect in the painting And then I'm going to go back to the streaker, streaky blender brush and soften these little highlight hairs I did just now. Not totally obscuring them or blending them away, but just softening them a bit. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stop painting here. It needs more work. I would like to take this to more of a finish, of course, but I do want to show you how I add that sort of film grain look, which actually is appropriate for this particular subject because it's a vintage photo uh, that has real actual, you know, film grain in it. Of course, it's a JPEG and there's a lot of artifacts in there that are just digital artifacts, but that's only if you get too close. If you zoom back out, you can see this really cool, natural vintage film grain in the uh, painting or in the photo. So what I do is I create a new layer on top of my existing painting and I fill it with a middle gray. It's important that it's middle gray, that it's right in between light and dark. You don't want it too light or too dark because it'll affect the overall values in the end. And if it is, if this effect does make the painting look darker or lighter than I wanted, I can still adjust it at that point. But so what I'm doing here is just putting a middle gray filling to the entire canvas. And then I'm going to add a filter to this layer, to this new layer. And it's important that you do this on a separate layer. Don't do it on the same layer as you're painting. Um, I'm going to go to noise. Uh, what is it? Is it add noise, I think? Yeah. And it makes this into like, it looks like TV static, basically. And you can change the amount of it if you want. The more you do it, uh, the higher the, it is on the slider scale, the uh, more grainy it's going to be. And if it's going to be viewed small on the web, you know, on a web page or on a um, on a phone, 
it's important that the grain be pretty big. Uh, you can choose monochromatic is probably better than, yeah, color. Color is, um, you get all these little red, green, and blues in there. You don't need that. You just want it to be monochromatic. And usually I find Gaussian works better than uniform. So there's uniform and there's Gaussian. I don't know technically what the difference is. I just like the way Gaussian looks because it looks a little more irregular. So I'm going to uh, commit to that tr uh, transformation. And now I'm going to go back up to filter. Gaussian blur. So it's under blur, then Gaussian blur. And I'm blurring the, uh, the, the, the noise layer. Right now it's a radius of 2.5 pixels. You know, the more you blur it, the softer it's going to get. And uh, I think you don't want it too blurry. Like 2.5, whatever it was set at, is probably pretty good. Uh, you can judge for yourself how much you want to blur it just through some trial and error on your own image. It depends on your resolution of your original image. But I'm just going to soften that. Then, now that I've got this noise layer that's blurred, I'm going to convert it to, I think, soft light or overlay mode is usually pretty good. So here's overlay. It's kind of harsh, actually. Kind of a, makes it more contrasty. And here's soft light. Soft light, I think, actually works best. Uh, and then here's this picture with this great film grain in it. And it, it actually, you know, hides a lot of the subtle brushwork. So in a sense, it can actually, you know, hide some of your sins. It's a way of actually getting around, uh, you know, some of your painting errors or sloppiness. It, it sort of blends them away. It just, it doesn't look, they don't look as visible anymore. But there's this uniform coating over the entire image of this natural grain. Uh, and, you know, if it's too strong, you can definitely just reduce the opacity a little bit. You know, here's the opacity back to zero. Here's what it looks like without it. And then here it is at about 30%. Here it is at about 50%. 75%. 75 is good. I find 100% is a little bit strong. It's it's just too a little too in your face. It's It's like obvious that you used a texture, you know, a filter on top of everything. So I like to reduce it a little bit, just knock it back a little bit. And uh, and there you go, voila, it looks like sort of like it adds like a ceiling layer, like a varnish or something on it. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really, but it's it's kind of like when you add a varnish to a finished oil painting, it gives it that sort of, you just finish the look, it, it looks completed. So um, it's not, you know, varnish has other properties too, like enhancing the contrast. So it's I don't mean literally, it's like putting a varnish on the painting. It's just adding that final step that makes it a little more interesting, I think, to look at. Uh, and if, with a vintage image like this, uh, where you want it to look a little bit old-fashioned, that, that's kind of a fun thing to do sometimes. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, are there any more questions? Emily, you love visible brush strokes. Yeah, me too. Um, and this noise filter does eliminate a lot of the brush strokes. You know, if I, t if I take it away, you can see, you know, there's some cool streakiness happening in places and blurred canvas type grain showing through and it doesn't disappear entirely but it definitely makes things less noticeable it sort of unifies everything uh let's see yeah photoshop tips shiny it's always good to know those kind of things uh paul mccartney seems to my eye to look somewhat more juvenile in your rendition yeah i guess he did you know i i heighten some of his characteristics that make a person look younger i think by making a larger cranium making a smaller chin area definitely i think de-ages him a bit but that's kind of what i wanted to show i wanted to show him as that young babe you know the um just like right out of childhood almost because he always he was the beetle that always had sort of the most childlike look anyway he always maintained that baby face uh rick thanks yeah okay cool well i guess that's it for today guys we're right at time and i want to thank all of you for joining and sticking with me the whole time and hope you got some tips out of it hope you maybe can go try some of your own paintings now this way where you paint with shapes rather than with lines um who knows maybe it'll actually work out for you um if there's any uh questions i didn't answer in the uh chat or we didn't get to we missed them just please let me know in the comments and i'll get back to them and uh if you have any other suggestions also for future live streams like i think alan said something about wanting to see more caricature bodies we'll definitely put that down on the list and do it in the future anyway that's it everybody thank you for joining be safe take care of yourself Bye-bye.